some unfortunate individuals found themselves in some remote camp for their religious beliefs alone. Joseph Stalin and his government wanted no competition, be it from God or any internationally connected religion. In Stalin's mind and in the ideology he was promoting, religion was the opium of the people to echo Marx's famous phrase. And it perhaps served as an alternate ideology to the state. And it gave people an alternate sense of loyalty to something beyond the state. And of course, in religion at its best, uh, nurtures a sense of personal conscience. And the regime was trying to destroy that, to squash that. In Stalin's world, all religions were enemies of the state, with the Christian Orthodox at the top of their list. Right behind, surprisingly, were the Jehovah's Witnesses, a relatively new sect hardly steeped in power. The Witnesses, nonetheless, gave the regime major concern with their staunch allegiance to their beliefs and dignified acceptance of the consequences. One would not realize this history of severe persecution in the Jehovah's Witnesses pastoral center outside of St. Petersburg. Yet Vasily Karlin and Nikolai Dubovinsky can testify to the hardship they suffered for their faith. The family of Vasily Karlin was offered amnesty if they would renounce their faith. They refused. Of course, at this point there was nothing else to do but carry out the orders. They were given two hours to gather their things. There was a thorough search. They took away all our literature, and like all the others, we ended up in Siberia. For six months, they investigated me. They questioned me at everything. The materials I had with me they brought into evidence. And in August of 1957, I was put on trial. I was sentenced to execution. There were two of us, no, four of us, who were sentenced to capital punishment, and then it was commuted to 25 years. All of that for declining to renounce one's faith. Viktor Chevyaku, now living in Vancouver, British Columbia, managed to escape this pressure on the Jehovah's Witnesses. He relived the persecution of his family while visiting the Gulag exhibition at Boston University. There was nothing not to like about them as about people because they were hardworking, honest people. They got along with their neighbors well. But the Soviet government had an intention to establish the worldwide communism. And Jehovah's Witnesses were preaching about worldwide kingdom of God, heavenly kingdom. And uh, the idea of heavenly kingdom did not fit the Soviet ideology. Therefore, Jehovah's Witnesses unwillingly became ideological enemies of the Soviet regime. On the other end of the religious spectrum was a Roman Catholic priest. Father Walter Chizek was a Jesuit missionary arrested in Russia in 1941 as a Vatican spy. He was imprisoned and tortured for five years in the infamous Lubyanka prison, where Russians sarcastically joked that Lubyanka had the best view in Moscow, since from it you could see all the way to Siberia. Father Richard Blake is a Jesuit from the New York province where Father Chizik spent his last two decades of freedom before his death in 1984. His mission in 1937 was to find out the condition of the Catholics who were further into the Soviet Union, the Ukraine and the Soviet Union. But that was enough for the government to give him a 16-year jail sentence in the, the Gulags, the work camps. In the camps near the Arctic Circle, Father Chizik continued his ministry, living with threats all the time. I was in a place where I was always threatened. Didn't have to threaten me, I was in it. In such a place that any moment they'd call you out and shoot you. And I thought I was going to be, be shot. I mean, I was under that, that impression. That, that's what they insinuated. Well, he was an ordinary laboring man. He worked in the labor camps. That was part of his disguise, was that uh, he was just an ordinary worker. 
but he had some extraordinary uh, adventures in trying to minister to people in you know, terrible conditions, trying to serve and minister to the, the people that were there. The story was that he would never be allowed to leave the country because he knew too much about the prison camps and interrogation techniques. The Soviet government released a statement that he had died, and it was only later, when he was able to smuggle some documents out, that the family realized that he was still alive, and the United States government went to work on it and tried to get an exchange of prisoners, which they did in 1963. So two convicted Soviet spies in the U.S. Uh, were sent back to Russia, and Father Chizik was sent back to the United States. Secular or religious, ideological or politically naive, all fell victim to a heartless regime that continued on for years during the Cold War. There is little accounting and no roll call for the legion of the lost in the failed and discredited Soviet Union's wretched gulag experience. And so the massive scale of the human suffering has almost been lost to history. But some can speak for the many departed. Arkady Berdichevsky is such a man. His saga survives over the years because of the persistence of a loving wife and the dedication of the admiring son he hardly knew. At the age of 72, John Utley embarked on a journey to discover the fate of his father, lost to the Gulag, which would lead him to the edge of the Arctic Circle. John Utley was born in Moscow in 1934. His father, Arkady Berdichevsky, was a distinguished man of affairs, a Russian diplomat and former member of the government's Arcos trade mission in London. John's mother, Frida Utley, was London-born and educated, an accomplished scholar and writer steeped in Russian economics and fired by the idealism that characterized the young British communists of the period. Her experiences are vividly set down in her memoir, The Lost Illusion. My mother was active in the Socialist Party and was the chairman of the, of the Socialist Party at London University. And she met my father, who was with the Russian trade delegation in Russia, and they fell in love. On April 10th, 1936, at two o'clock in the morning, there was a knock at the door of Arkady and Frida's small Moscow apartment. Russian secret police officers entered, without explanation, arrested Arkady and led him off into the interminable night. Frida and John would never see him again. The police had been investigating his boss. My father was the, uh, what would today be called, chief financial officer of, of a, a group called Prom Export, was the government import-export organization. And they were investigating for some exports that should not have been done. Arkady's arrest brought him to the infamous Lubyanka prison, where he was interrogated and finally accused of subversive Trotskyite activities and sentenced to five years imprisonment. Still holding a British passport, Frieda was able to escape with her son. Back in London, she worked feverishly to free her husband, or at least give him the chance to defend himself. So when my father was arrested, she got managed to get a letter sent to Stalin, signed by George Bernard Shaw, Bertrand Russell, many of the top English leftists of the time. Their letters to Stalin only resulted in silence. Following his mother's death, John Utley continued his quest. He later gained the help of George Krasnow, a Russian educator and early defector who petitioned the FSB, successor to the notorious KGB secret police, for documents on his behalf. The new information finally led John and George Krasnow to Komi, a desolate region in northernmost Russia the size of France, much of it sprawling within the Arctic Circle. At the time, the Komi Republic was chosen by the Soviet government as one of the principal regions where the camps were to be located. 
This is first of all because it is a huge territory and sparsely settled. In the 30s, the population totaled not more than 300,000 people. And this territory is very rich in natural resources. There is timber here, there is coal, oil, natural gas here. But there are no roads and no major cities. And it was decided that the populating of the territory was to be accomplished through the work of prisoners. To this godforsaken extremity of the imagination, the remote city of Oktar, John Utley unearthed the raw details of his father's bitter fate. I am Evgenia Zelenskaya, the chair of the Ukta Pochorsk organization, Memorial. We are here in the city of Ukta. This is where the Gulag began. From here, scores of prisoners were sent to Vorkuta, to Unta, to the Vevusha region. The center of it all was here until 1938. The history of our city could not have happened without the labor of the prisoners. The prisoners created all of the industry of the city, in our region, in our republic. Since 2001, John Utley is the only American who came here and searched for his father. This is the building where I was given the file of my father. They showed me the card, a five by seven card showing his history in the camps and finally transfer to the third department, which was a euphemism for execution in Russia. John, I want to show you John, I would like to show you the seventh volume published by us. These are the lists of prisoners of the camps from Stalin's time, and among them you will find a familiar surname, Bedroshevsky, Arkady Yakolevich, a prisoner of the Ukhta Pekorsh camp of the NKVD. Your father was executed by firing squad on the 30th of March, 1938, in Vorkuta. And so it was that John Basil Utley was finally able to close the book on his father, a senseless victim of Gulag atrocity some 70 years earlier. On that day, hundreds upon hundreds, alleged enemies of the state were executed, with the sounds of gunfire reverberating in the relentless cold. The new Russia will have to deal with confronting the ghosts of its past, those who are reluctant to do so are fiercely challenged by those who insist it is crucial to act now. Irina Flick from the Human Rights Group Memorial in St. Petersburg works hard to restore the collective memory of the Russian people. Her colleagues have helped to excavate the remains of 30,000 people killed in the Stalinist purges. There is a legacy of the Gulag, but there is no memory of the Gulag in the national consciousness. This paradox informs the current problem with society's dialogue with the past. The Soviet terror, which accompanied almost the entire history of the 20th century, was directed toward the destruction of people and the erasure of the memory of people. The forces brought to bear in that mad endeavor were awesome. But in the end, they failed, because memory resisted. This memory was preserved for years, for decades. This memory was realized in manuscripts written for the drawer, in the miracle of preserved photographs. This memory was personal. This was memory without a voice, a whisper. Such a secret memory was the basic form of resistance to the terror. And when the terror eased, gradually in the 1960s and 1970s, and then finally passed with the collapse of the old communist order in the late 1980s, new hope emerged from the ashes. What resulted is a citizen crusade called Memorial.